We're going to get started. First of all, hello and welcome. This is the keynote lecture of the third annual Pew Symposium. I'm James Dodera, and I direct the Center for International Security Studies here, and also Project Q, which is hosting this event, uh, along with Sydney Ideas. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming to this very special event. Before I introduce our speaker, I do want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the EORA Nation who have been here for a very long time, and to pay my respects to elders past and present. And in the same spirit of hospitality, I want to thank all of you, but also um, who come from Sydney, but some come from a great distance away. I want to give you a warm welcome. I know that you came from some cold countries. I think Oslo, Norway is winning right now. Uh, but thanks a lot for making the long trip. We're all very much aware that it's something of a trans-oceanic leap of faith to come to events like this. And um, we always appreciate people who are willing to do it. I have some local supporters to thank from the bottom of my heart. The first is uh, our new uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, uh, Duncan Iveson who unfortunately couldn't be here. He's tending to an ailing father in Canada. He sends his best wishes, and we send them back to him. I offer big shots of gratitude, and to be followed by shots of single malt, to two guys who brought me to this party, along with Duncan. Uh, Simon Twarmy, who's the uh, head of school of social and political sciences, and Colin White, our chair of the Department of Government and International Relations. These are three remarkable scholar administrators, and they backed Project Q from the get-go, and they earn, I think, or certainly earn my top candidates for best colleagues ever. So thank you very much. Finally, I want to thank the man who pays our bills, Andrew Carnegie, but he's dead. So I'll extend my gratitude to his personal emissary, who's here with us today, Stephen Del Rosso, the Director of Peace and Security Program at the Carnegie Corporation. Thanks, Steve, wherever you are in the audience, um, for having a flutter on a roughie. If you don't know what that means, that's Aussie talk for basically for taking the long shot, for betting on the long shot. So thank you very much for doing that more than once. And those unfamiliar with Project Q, I do have a word or two to say about it because I think our vision and strategy, which was really an attempt to restart and reconnect a very fitful conversation between the humanities and the sciences but as well between the theory and practice of world politics, the natural and social sciences, and to reconnect it around a central question. What are the implications of quantum innovation for peace and security? This is a question I think has gone vague for too long, and I just want to say a word or two about why I think that's important before I introduce our speaker. Now, this conversation has been going on for over a century, but it hasn't really intruded into many of the other disciplines. Uh, the discovery of quanta, these discrete packages of energy. The second stage, the thought experiments and uh, mathematical proofs that produced the revolution of quantum mechanics. And the disruptive quantum applications that followed uh, before, but mainly after the Second World War that do include, most notably, atomic weapons, but also radar, transistors, lasers, computers, and that, uh, if we extend it a little further, um, our mobile phones. But now, in the 21st century, as we witness today in a tour of our remarkable nanoscience lab um, that Steve and Michael Burchek um, graciously offered, we're seeing how they're being applied um, in a possible final stage triggered by quantum innovations in energy and information that are transforming the practice of computing, communication, encryption, artificial intelligence, and probably Steve and Michael will tell us even other applications. So, Altogether, I think this constitutes really a quantum age. And I think the big bang, as it were, of the quantum age is, of course, the dropping of the nuclear bomb in, over Japan. And indeed, the ethical imperative of Project Q really comes from this event, or actually the events leading up to the, the first use of nuclear weapons. And that, of course, was the letter in 1939 from um, Albert Einstein, written with his colleague, uh, Leo Villard, that went to the president of the time, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in 1939 saying, you know, this nuclear fission, it has peaceful applications, but has the potential for great destructive capacity, a great destructive weapon. This warning in 1939 triggered a political chain reaction, the Manhattan Project, Los Malamos, 
the use of the bomb and arms race, and of course, the Cold War. It also, to show how all these technologies are dual-edged, brought atoms for peace, um, to the extent that it is not an oxymoron. A Cold War that really never went hot, partially because of mutual assured destruction, and a global movement as the you know, yin to this yang to control and reduce nuclear weapons. So basically, what Einstein did was, you know, he peered over the edge of the abyss after the Second World War, and he tried, he saw the world as it was, and he tried to envision a world as it might be. The idea of really harnessing nuclear energy for peaceful uses, but also to establish the imperative for, if not world government, something certainly more peaceful than the anarchy of states that had preceded the Second World War. He issued a prescient warning several years after that letter to the president. And you're probably familiar with this warning. He said, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. Now, Project Q is somewhat of a coda and response to this, this warning, this lament of Albert Einstein. It's our collective effort to move away from a tragic repetition of history and towards a creative response to these innovations, these innovations in quantum theory, both positive and possibly perilous. Our strategy in Project Q is to engage peace and security scholars, diplomats and soldiers, historians and futurists in a critical dialogue on this question. You know, what are the implications for peace and security? And every year we assemble at the quarantine station. We uh, come up with some answers, we hope, to the quantum question. And we're going to be doing that uh, this weekend as well with the invited participants. So we're here today to open the third annual Q Symposium. And we have with us, I think, a gifted scholar, Jaris Grove. He's um, a rising scholar of political theory, international relations, the nascent field of what we might call disruptive technology studies. He's a polymath who very early in his career displayed, I believe, and I've seen it on display several times in person, uh, an uncanny ability to bridge these communities, the interpretive and scientific communities, but to take the quantum conversation deeper while making it more intelligible. And he provides, I think, an historical context while also being really ahead of the curve in many of these debates. And most importantly, for a project that we pride ourselves on our pluralism, he really makes forceful arguments without trampling contesting viewpoints. He really seems to enjoy a good debate. So I, I value that greatly, and it's why we've invited him to come here to speak today. Just a word or two about his credentials, uh, BA with honors at the University of Texas in Austin, before he went on to complete a PhD uh, in political science at Johns Hopkins. He took some time off, although given what he did with that time off, I'd say it's more like he took time on to become a member and then direct the Urban Debating League, which is quite remarkable nonprofit that works with disadvantaged students and educators to help kids and educators in the inner cities develop advocacy skills through competitive debate. It's been remarkable. I was getting, can I tell the story just very, very quickly? When I was teaching at Brown, I get these remarkable emails from these young high school students, I don't know, from all over, and they'd be asking like, how can I apply Virilio's ideas about um, speed and simulation to this debate I have to uh, stage you know, some capital somewhere? I get these over and over again. I was so impressed by it that I invited them to apply to Brown. And two of Jarrett's um, students ended up graduating with honors from Brown University. So I can tell in a personal way that he's had an impact. He's currently assistant professor in the political science department, director of the Center for Future Studies at the University of Hawaii, where he teaches some remarkable courses that I think illustrate um, an axiopic, if somewhat apocalyptic view of the world. He teaches the future of biopolitics, global war, global security in the post-apocalypse, the political economy of global violence, and zombies. His most recent publications can be found in a variety of journals, Theory and Event, Boston Review. He has three book manuscripts that will be coming out soon. The uh, Ends of War, a Dangerous Algorithms, a Post-Human Theory of Security, and Must We Persist to Continue. Now, the real reason why I invited Dress is because he's a really big fan of the seminal New York No Way rock band Sonic Youth, who know a thing about disruptive technologies. I was attempted to blast Cool Thing here uh, before he came to the stage, but 
better judgment prevailed. So instead, I'm going to ask you all to make some noise and welcome Jerry Scrub. <laughs> So I have a couple of thank yous as well, as this talk has been uh, quite a long time in the making, uh, in the sense that about three weeks before the Q1, my mentor and advisor, William Conley, couldn't make the trip uh, from Baltimore to Sydney. He told James that he should give me a call, uh, at which point in time uh, I tried to learn everything I could about quantum effects on philosophy in roughly 13 days uh, and show up and not sound like a total idiot. Uh, I'm not sure if I prevailed, but at the very least, James invited me back. So there are a couple things uh, that I want to say. So first, I want to thank James for giving me the gift of borrowed confidence. We live in a mean world, and James' generosity and apparent extreme tolerance for risk <laughs> have been transformative <laughs> to my life as a thinker and my career as a scholar. He's done nothing less than create a space for creativity and intellectual experimentation that should, in our age, the neoliberalization of universities no longer exist. The leaders uh, at this university, like Duncan Iveson, Simon Torme, Colin White, that have had James's back in that endeavor, deserve our respect and our gratitude. This is a rare thing uh, that we do this weekend, uh, and I take that quite seriously. Uh, beyond, beyond the intellectual pursuits uh, and the common interests that James and I have, he's a true friend, uh, I would say, in a world of assassins. Uh, I also want to thank Colin White as an interlocutor. Colin is a skeptic with valor. His critique is never cynical. Uh, he is always relentlessly challenging and generous with his time and interest. Colin has been a crucial component of keeping this project honest and rigorous, and, in my opinion, has written the best book as of yet on the structural effects of the international system in producing terrorism, uh, something I will not be touching on today, uh, as I think he actually uh, is close to the final word. I also uh, want to thank Charlotte Epstein, even though she's not here, for being a philosophical force. She's always committed to keeping me philosophically honest. For those who make point of showing that I don't know anything about science, she always does her best to show that I also know nothing about philosophy. I also want to thank Megan McKenzie, who I think is uh, in, the, in the midst or on the precipice of her own process philosophy in the form of the creation of something quite new for having simply the best bullshit detector in the business. For the past two years, her response has been incisive and true. Uh, Megan possesses an incredible gift of seeing and theorizing the complexity of the empirical while avoiding the temptation of making the empirical mysterious for mystery's sake. Uh, I consider her an invaluable mentor in a field that I very rarely feel at home in. Uh, and lastly, uh, a list that I know I'll leave out, uh, but Jose, Jack, Raylene, Chris Neff, Brian, and many others uh, make this a remarkable weekend that seems as if it runs by itself, as if it were auto-poetic and self-organized, but for which there is gallons of sweat poured into. So today, uh, I'm going to try to do a lot in the next 42 minutes that I have remaining. I'm going to try to give uh, a bit of a brief uh, introduction to what I think we've been up to the last two years, at least what I've learned from the last two years uh, and where we are and think about what it is from quantum physics uh, that we want to try to stretch into these other realms. I'm then going to try to do the next, I think, maybe impossible task, which is to argue something that I, that I offered last year, uh, which is this idea that the quantum crisis at the turn of the, the sort of 19th and 20th century wasn't just a crisis in physics. Uh, it was actually a crisis in philosophy and social theory as well. Uh, and there are analogs and parallels for which I think contest the sort of central concern uh, which is that the interest in quantum is science envy. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. I think there's a much larger dialogue and conversation that we ought to be extending through multiple disciplines, uh, which provide, I think, a foundation for thinking about what it is we're doing here. And finally, there's, you know, I can cover everything as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm going to try to show why affect theory, which was introduced by the humanities uh, and the social sciences, uh, could use a bit of the rigor of quantum physics, uh, but unfortunately lacks the mathematical sort of language, right, which unifies physics, and see what that does to the way that we understand uh, what I think are new forms of terrorism, in particular ISIS. Uh, I'm not interested in the organizational structure of ISIS. What I'm interested in is what it is that ISIS is able to accomplish as what I'm calling an event. That is to say that they may not even be aware of everything they accomplish, but we just watched a primary in New Hampshire uh, in which 
Donald Trump won by 20 points uh, after lagging uh, and looking like he was going to lose first place literally hours before the San Bernardino shooting. So why is it a shooting which has no relationship to ISIS? Right? We now know there's no connection to ISIS. There's maybe a little bit of interest, some fandom, be the equivalent of saying that I'm really into Bowie and therefore somehow I'm related to Bowie. And yet, right, uh, I'm not related to Bowie, yeah. I've never met the guy. And yet, it has produced this effect which may change the outcome at least of one party's primary, but certainly uh, I think of the character uh, of the United States. So I, I think this is sort of where, where I'm trying to go, is, is how can we bring a lot of the provocations and crises created by quantum physics uh, into a realm that is sorely and desperately needing uh, a bit of an update. So what have we been up to the last two years? The first, I think, is that we've come to the conclusion as a group, I think, in a large capacity, I won't quite call it a consensus, but that much of social science, particularly those following behavioralism and positivism, are indebted to a scientific worldview uh, that is out of touch with the mechanics of reality, which is not to say that we are trying to give up on empiricism, but that empiricism much be, may be much weirder right, than the kind of predictable order uh, and relationship to inductive reasoning uh, that we were taught to suspect. Two, that the shortcomings of social science are not a reason to jump on the quantum bandwagon. As I think, and Collins made this point quite vociferously, uh, we'd be trading one form of science envy, one from roughly the 17th century, for another form of science envy, which would be awesome because at least we could update to the 20th century, uh, but it, it wouldn't do us much better. Right? It, it would just be, in some sense, hoping for handouts from another field. The third is that quantum physics is not the end of philosophy. Uh, and I think Charlotte has maybe made that argument most clearly. That quite the opposite, that social science suffers from first order metaphysical problems. And better knowledge of the empirical world will not make those problems go away. Uh, in fact, not at all. In fact, I think they repeat a lot of the errors uh, that we confront. Four. However, I think quantum physics can be useful as a set of metaphors. Uh, and I think at its most basic level, that proof of concept is, is done, right? We've seen that these metaphors are extraordinarily powerful for changing the way that we do research and thinking. Complementarity as an sort of alternative to predictability or uncertainty. Entanglement uh, as thinking about deep relationality within the world as opposed to sort of simple notions of social relationality. And this wave particle duality to keep us from thinking in sort of dichotomous terms. That things can actually be both and and either or at the same time in international politics. Uh, and that that's more co common than we'd expect. But what I tried to push and I'll push a lot in this talk is that quantum physics is only a sliver of the quantum crisis. Philosophy and social theory were undergoing a similar crisis that was in direct dialogue with physicists like Einstein, Bohr, Schrodinger, and Heisenberg. And I think if you look at the philosophical writings of all of these physicists, you will also see a moment uh, which we should actually be quite romantic for, right? A moment where a physicist has a sophisticated and working knowledge of Kant's critique of pure reason. Where a physicist is looking for the latest papers by people like Martin Heidegger. Uh, where the dialogue was not something that had to be bridged, it was something that scholarly people were supposed to do because scholarly people were to be taken seriously. Uh, and I think that moment for me is one of the most important insights from this quantum period, which is that we, we ought to have, in some sense, a dialogue because we are stuck with a lot of the same hard problems. We just have different modes of inquiry. Uh, and that this part, which I think has been mostly lost, is that social theory created significant contributions that are not reducible to physics. In fact, I'm going to argue that affect has some of the many similar problems with spatiotemporality, that I don't think physics will actually ever be able to solve them. Uh, and nor do I think that we can do the old constructivist move of saying, well, don't worry, just in the realm of ideas. So we'll keep that, and you all get to play with the mechanics of the world. These are real things that are in the world, but may not, in some sense, be measurable by physics. Uh, and lastly, that the allure of quantum computing, I think we've also come in somewhat to a conclusion, belies as much of the metaphysical crisis of physics and philosophy and poses a direct challenge to democratic forms of decision-making and accountability. Uh, and part of what I'm going to argue today is that while quantum computing can be extraordinarily powerful, it has the same problem as positivism, which thinks it can move ahead with a without asking sort of first-order problems. Not just metaphysical problems, but also ethical moral problems about what quantum computing means. 
right, what it would mean to be, quote unquote, more powerful. Uh, and I think that is actually uh, one of our central tasks. So uh, James made me promise that I try to quickly sum up what I thought the crisis of quantum physics was. Uh, this is the part where I always feel like a sham. So those of you who are actually quantum physicists, you know, take it easy on me. But this is, in some sense, the way that quantum physics strikes me, right? It's what provokes the kind of thinking I'm trying to do. Uh, so if you don't feel like it's the best capturing of the question, at least try to go with me that you could see why it might provide a philosophical challenge to the way that we might try to research things which we can't measure or describe mathematically. For me, and this is sort of a big group, uh, discreteness or this, this, the observer problem in Bohr, uh, entanglement or the communication between particles with no seeming connection uh, in John Bell's research, non-locality as electrons with probabilities rather than as an object of particular coordinates. It's, I think, not a coincidence that at the same time that there was an anti-essentialist turn in process philosophy around, you know, 1920, 1930, physicists were coming to the same conclusion, that the idea of essence or platonic form was insufficient for understanding things that were ontologically real. Second, that this was also a crisis of scale. Uh, in Heisenberg's book on philosophy and quantum physics, uh, one of the key questions uh, that he notes is that there was this tendency to circumscribe what the quantum meant for the larger world. But so obviously to him, thinking about the effects, particularly the mutagenic and often lethal effects of radiation, obviously quantum scale phenomena could impact not only one species, not only the structure of an organism, but also the direction and potential evolution of whole species or even system-wide mutations. Uh, and so this idea that one couldn't contain the quantum to a particular scale, I think is vastly important. And also the mess of space-time, uh, that the basic makeup of perceived reality may not be conforming to empirical testing, that how we experience space-time may be radically disparate with the different ways in which space-time actually functions. And this isn't just Einstein's relativity theory, it's also a kind of post-Kantian term where we can't take the schema of time-space as being some kind of transcendental a priori, where this is how things always work. In fact, I think what will become quite clear when we look at the affect of ISIS, things take us by surprise, reorient our spatiality, reorient our temporality, drag us into the past or drag us into the future quite rapidly without you know, losing the entire structure of transcendental subjectivity. And finally, that causality and contingency aren't what we thought it was. That Bohr's concept of complementarity questions whether reality is path dependent or strictly contingent, and whether novelty can emerge semi-autonomously from initial conditions. Is there a real chance in novelty in the world? This is a thing that strikes Alfred North Whitehead, uh, which I'll talk about at some point. So in the words of Heisenberg, uh, it's sort of the end of quantum physics and philosophy. He leaves us with this sort of chastened image of what he thinks physics can achieve. He says, the hope of understanding all aspects of intellectual life on the principles of classical physics is no more justified than the hope of the traveler who believes he will have obtained the answers to all problems once he has journeyed to the end of the world. It's nearly identical to the way that Heidegger starts being in time. But the analytic of being as a question, the question of being, actually we'll get no closer to with all the anthropology, sociology, or political science in the world. Because every investigation will have to return to that analytic, that question which frames other questions. And I think for Heisenberg, that's where he ended up as well. So I'm going to propose something that I'm loosely calling quantum social theory. Uh, it's a little bit of science envy, uh, mostly to make the connection to quantum explicit, which I think is actually quite easy to do. Uh, the three thinkers I'm going to talk about were all in, in fairly frequent dialogue with the primary researchers of quantum physics. They shared universities, they shared letters, and they, they went off on tangents. Uh, in the case of Alfred North Whitehead, he said quite explicitly that Einstein awoke him from his dogmatic slumber. He'd been a rationalist working with you know, Bertrand Russell. He thought that there was this sort of logical principle that ordered the the universe and not so much. Uh, he could at least recognize that the mathematics that Einstein was working with demonstrated otherwise. I'll say, uh, and this is you know, a long-term hope, uh, it's a shame in some sense uh, that we, we don't cultivate philosophers who still have the capacity to check the math of physicists. Uh, in fact, quite explicitly, uh, in Whitehead's book, he does just that. 
Whether or not he gets the math right is, a, I think, a secondary question to the fact that he felt the confidence and the audacity to need to work through the mathematical proof before taking it seriously as a philosophical question. The conclusion he comes to is that there is no discreteness between objects and relations. And quite the opposite, he argues that discreteness is an effect of relations being punctuated by what he calls events. He says, we live in a world of becoming that is all process. Causation is not a before and after or a cause and effect, but the making intensive of concrete relations. An event comes to make a cut in relations. And the objects that persist or remain concrete are the things that we call objects, but their discreteness is the historical result of the event. It's not some essence to the thing. I know that sounds a little bit abstract, but uh, I think you'll see why it's important. The second is that the world is the process and becoming of novelty rather than the me mechanics of contingency. He's citing, I think, strongly uh, with Maxwell that there isn't some kind of hypothetical demon where if we could get outside of time and space, right, if we didn't have the limitations of embodiment, we knew enough variables that we could predict the future indefinitely into the future. Quite the opposite, that each process creates a new reality, that each event alters all conditions of relations. This is the part that's sort of hard for me to wrap my head around. In his words, every event from the smallest metabolic process to the largest political event, to the largest cosmic event, is part of one cosmic conspiracy. And he means conspiracy in a kind of dramaturgical way, not an actual like creative design, uh, but quite the opposite, that every other relation is implicated in every other relation. And the difference is the intensity at the locality where it takes place. So the particular intensity where it happens alters and cascades through everything else, setting up the next condition of possibility for the next event. The second major thinker, which I think we've lost, unfortunately, uh, but has come back through the work of Bruno Latour and Joe Deleuze, uh, but I don't think as rigorously as he should, is Gabriel Tard. Tard, who was a uh, rough contemporary of Weber and Durkheim, uh, argued that humans in particular are an imitative and entangled species. I like this idea of imitative and entangled that we are innovating and sinking swarms at multiple scales, from crowds to nations, and even planetary scale assemblages. And what he means by imitation is actually quite unique. That we are imitative in our reactive capacity, meaning we respond to one another through a number of cues from print to body to facial expression to what we see. But that even though there is a unison of reaction, there's actually a high degree of difference in how that reaction plays out as a process. So there's a kind of dialogue between Whitehead and Tard here at the social level where this process is actually what's going to change the character of how imitation takes place. And I think this provides not only a, a kind of material conceit, but a, a deep explanation of process behind ideas like the way that James has in the past described sort of mimetic warfare and other kinds of mimetic politics. Right? It's not just some kind of metaphysical proposition. He thinks it's profoundly implicated and what it means to be human. So for Tard, the agent structure problem is not a problem, right? That what we have are these kind of coagulation points, right? These cooling points where a lot of imitation coagulates into a consistency. Uh, and so then it shouldn't be surprising that those structures will be predictable over a period of time. But it also shouldn't be surprising that one of, one of those unison events happens where everybody tightens up or feels the effect of an affect, that someone does something a little bit differently. And that sometimes those differences cascade into new structures. Right? That they may actually alter the rules by which things take place. We'll say the atom bomb. For me, the improvised explosive device in Iraq. These seeming subtle changes that alter the way that we understand things like power or structure. The last one is a guy named Henri Bergson, who actually debated Einstein quite publicly. For me, the most important part of Brickstone is this idea that affects like fear, which is the main affect I'll be talking about in terms of ISIS, are intensive, not extensive magnitudes. And this simple idea between an intensive thing, which has a magnitude, I'm more or less afraid, but can't be quantified except arbitrarily, I think is an extraordinarily powerful idea. Because how much of global politics in the world is an intensive magnitude? Meaning to create a metric to measure it, you have to arbitrarily say, could you rate your fear on a 1 through 10 scale? Uh, what would that mean? It's not as if fear breaks up like a wave packet. Right? We, don't, we don't have that kind of quanta of measurement. 
Now, Bergson thinks that this is actually a characteristic of reality, not a characteristic of the failure to measure. And he actually captures it quite well in the introduction to Time and Free Will. He says, we necessarily express ourselves by means of words, and we usually think in terms of space. That is to say, language requires us to establish between our ideas the same sharp and precise distinctions, the same discontinuity as between material objects. This assimilation of thought to things is useful in practical life and necessary in most of the sciences. But it may be asked whether the insurmountable difficulties presented by certain philosophical problems do not arise from our placing side by side in space phenomena which do not occupy space, and whether by merely getting rid of the clumsy symbols round which we are fighting, we might not bring the fight to an end. When an illegitimate translation of the unextended into the extended or quality into quantity has introduced contradiction in the very heart of the question, contradiction must, of course, recur in the answer. And I think that actually has a lot to do with the shortcomings of contemporary investigation. So what does it have to do with international relations? Why would IR need this? And I think part of it is that IR has actually always been interested in, in spooky action at a distance. Uh, think about core concepts of IR. How does deterrence work? Well, the main use of nuclear weapons is not the detonation of nuclear weapons. It's pointing and targeting them at people. Well, what is pointing and targeting? Right? Well, we could say it's a, a mentality, that it's just a state of mind. But that wouldn't be accurate, right? Because it's states of minds, right? There's some collective capacity, in some cases thousands or tens of thousands of people, which have to have a relationship of fear to where the weapon is targeted. Uh, and I think part of what I'm going to try to show about affect and the way that it can steal the future and kind of bootstrap it into the present is that the majority of Cold War politics, and Masumi has actually done a great job extending a lot of the work that, that James did on, on Virilio, is that Cold War politics was about playing out wars that were not significant as scenarios because we would actually fight them. But that the semiotic effect of the scenario playing would change the character or the fear or affect that it would inspire in the enemy. By what means and medium do you transfer fear? This is what affect is trying to do. This is what I'm going to try to explain. Because I, I think it's, it's, it doesn't work to say it's just an idea. Right? Fear isn't something that, well, OK, now that I know that nuclear weapons are pointed at me, uh, I feel deterred. Right? Uh, could you rate on you know, a scale of 1 to 10? How deterred do you feel today? Uh, right? They used to ask these kinds of questions at the Department of Defense, right? Like, how strong or credible do you think our deterrence is? Could you rate it? Herman Kahn, you know, would sort of spill out any number of ideas. Just as true of balancing, right? In what realm is the balancing taking place? Right? How do we share a kind of collective world where that balancing can be registered, responded to, and can have an effect in the present premised on the possibility of a future that is real in the present? Meaning the thing hasn't taken place, right? It's a potentiality, or what Deleuze calls a virtuality. But that virtuality is real in the sense that it articulates and reorganizes human and material behavior, right? It has an effect. It's ontologically real, even though an event in the way that we normally think about it physically has not taken place. Credibility, soft power, resonance. Pick your poison. There are ways of articulating fields of force, vectors of relations, for which there is no physical characteristic, but also would be inappropriate to say it's reducible to the interior of the mind. It's shared in a kind of collective and extended mind for which I don't want to sort of kick out uh, of the material world. The second is that affect theory, as it's been used so far in philosophy and critical social science, has basically solved this problem by being what I would call quasi-mystical. Uh, right? People talk about you know, kind of affect rays or affect being in the room. There are even some affect theorists who tried kind of weird William James-esque ghost hunting where they'd be like, well, maybe there is some particle of affect that will register. Right? We just haven't figured out how to measure it yet, which isn't actually, right, I, I think, probably a worthwhile pursuit or research. What it instead requires is that we develop a form of thinking which is not spatiotemporal, but is real. Uh, and I think that's actually a hard idea, both in physics and in the social sciences, to wrap our heads around. Right? It can cross the planet nearly instantaneously. Right? We can deter from one side of the planet to the other. Uh, and it can go through any number of media, right? from satellite intelligence 
to presumptions about the other, to the actual moving around of, of forces, but then it becomes real in the effects that it has. Uh, and so what, what would that be other than mystical? And that's, what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna try to hammer out. What is affect? The first is that affect is not emotion or feeling. Affect is the cause of emotion or feeling. So when we talk about an affect of fear, we're trying to talk about something which inspires the sensuous experience of fear, not the emotion itself. Because emotions don't fix the problem for us. Emotions are internal states of mind, right? If I have fear, that does not necessitate or explain in any way that I have a relationship to something else or the external world. Affect is semi-autonomous. It's an intensive force, the way that Bergson describes it, meaning that it has magnitude but not extension, right? You can't measure it. And that it alters mood of becoming, right? The way that becoming unfolds, the way the processes happen are actually framed by the mood of affect. Or to put it another way, affect is the agent provocateur of fear, right? So this is what I mean by semi-autonomous, right? It has to have some ontological existence that's not reducible to either of the states of mind that experience it, because it has to connect the two. But it's not fully autonomous, because it is also absurd to imagine a world where affect floats around waiting for us to exist. Does that make sense? Uh, but that that's, that's sort of hard to square. We don't like the th idea of things that are ontologically real, but semi-dependent on other things, uh, right? Which is another way of saying, how do we make relationality real rather than a metaphor? This means affect is mind independent, ontologically real, but not physical. And I actually want to reverse something that Alex Gwent does in this book, which is he says, we need to say that there are these things, right? Sort of like quantum phenomena, which are physical, but not material. And the reason why he wants to do that is he wants to deprive them of substance, right? To get over the kind of mind-body dualism. But he wants them to be under the kind of regulative principle of quantum mechanics. Uh, I don't see a reason why we should rush to presume that affect is regulated by quantum mechanics. I'd like to do quite the opposite. That everything is material, we can be monists. We don't have to believe in mind-body dualism or idea and matter. But that doesn't mean that everything is physical, right? And that that also isn't the realm of ideas. Or to quote John Philip Santos, the mind and heart leave no fossils. All of their artifacts are made of the most fleeting and unstable stuff, and yet they continue to beckon. The next, sorry, when I think of affect, you know, if, if there were ever a reason why I wanted to think about affect beams, uh, it's because I'm pretty sure that Trump can shoot them from his eyes. Uh, <laughs> But that wouldn't be sufficient, right? This is actually the problem that Weber has at the end of Economy and Society when he talks about the problem of charisma, right? First, he tries to locate charisma in the charismatic leader. He's like, well, but that's not right, right? It can't just be like a power. So then he tries to locate it in crowds, right? He does the sort of crowd theory of, of Freud and Cardin. He's like, well, that can't work either because then that would mean that every crowd, it wouldn't matter who stood up there. Uh, and so he goes back and forth. And the reason why he goes back and forth is because he needs causality to originate in one of the locations. It's not possible that the sort of semi-autonomous relation of affect between Trump and his supporters is actually what creates the effect. That there is a non-locality in the true sense, not in the metaphoric sense, of affect. It's a relation without location. And that despite that, affect is a force vector. It is a mind independently ontologically real, but not physical or a priori. It's not like a schema in Kant. Like one of these things we just presume because it works. Right? It has to have some characteristic that can alter the way that we interact with one another. Because it happens all the time. Uh, and most importantly, I think in the Trump and Rush Limbaugh case, uh, it's relatively impervious to ideology and facts. Right? The character with which we normally consider things real, uh, in the sort of Karl Popper sense, that they're falsifiable in some way, uh, doesn't work. Right? Falsifying them actually seems to have very little effect. Uh, just ask anyone dealing with climate change. So the fact that you can't identify or measure the substance uh, is exactly the distinction the Bergson means between intensive and extensive magnitude. Uh, as affects such as fear can become events or real virtualities that are only virtually actual, meaning they don't have substance, but they have effects. Meaning fear and other affects have effects, with an E, and function as ontologically real things, uh, and they do so by causally tunneling from the future or past. 
They question the efficacy, actually, of past and futurist categories. Something that could have taken place can actually have an effect. Right? Just think about what Holocaust denial has done to European nationalism. Something that might happen can have an effect. Think about the announcement a week ago uh, that there will be an ISIS attack within a year. And those effects are not probabilistic. Does that, does that make sense? And the affect of those effects are not dependent upon the statistical probability of whether or not either statement is true. And that's actually, that's a problem. Right? That's a problem politically, that's a problem ethically. Uh, truth is not a regulative ideal for the magnitude and power of affect, which should also tell us something about what ideology critique and the showing of facts can do to politics. Six, affect is real even if the relationship to physical events is vicarious or even specious, meaning nothing may have happened. And that's going to be the case in San Bernardino. And next, that affect is promiscuous and adhesive to people and things. And this is actually very important for me, uh, and a part of the way that I want to try to read ISIS. I don't actually think using a laptop to blow a hole in a plane, uh, or using a can of pineapple soda, which I'll talk about in a minute, to bring down a Russian plane is a mistake. I think it's a process of weaponizing the very objects we take for granted. It taps into what I think is a kind of metaphysical horror. The possibility that the world that we stand on is not stable, that anything can be a bomb, that anything can be under the guise of what I'm calling terror forming or world forming through terror, that it alters the rules of what we think is and isn't physically possible. And those rule changes, again, are real. They take place. They're not hypothetical. Second to last is that affect is not exclusive to the human species, but it is native to a central nervous system. I'm assuming it makes this point, I think, quite elegantly, right? This is a sort of Tardian idea that when a shooting takes place in San Bernardino, we all tighten up. One of my PhD students, uh, he's from South Carolina, is African American, said, it's like every time I walk into a Walmart and a very nice lady grabs her purse. That actually, that's a different kind of racism. She might actually be a very nice liberal, but for whatever reason, she's habituated. Her body has learned to be racist. And she might even be, you know, an Obama supporter. She may, in fact, love the literature of James Baldwin. But that, that ideology and that bodily habit are discordant, and one is not likely to retrain the other. Uh, and as he said, I still feel nervous every time it happens. That tightening has an effect because it's reactive. It comes before, in space and time, the conscious part of our brains. And this part is actually one of the most important for me, uh, is that affect is formative and constitutive despite not being directly observable, but precisely because we are both reactive and conscious beings. So affect takes place just before consciousness, right? the tightening up. And then consciousness has to make sense of that. Uh, and that interval in between, I think, is the kind of native territory of affect. Uh, and part of the reason why it's so powerful in the way that it creates change. So why, why do I think ISIS, in particular, requires uh, you know, a pretty detailed, hard, and complex understanding of an event that's real but can't be observed and blah, 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 blah? Well, part of it is that ISIS has more in common with Michael Bay than it has with any interpretation of Islam. This is the cover of the first issue of ISIS's journal saturated colors, explosions, American soldiers, until it burns, the Crusader armies, and Dabi. And I think even if ISIS doesn't think this through, and I have no way to know, I don't have intelligence data, it's impossible not to say that the means by which ISIS uses force magnifiers function at this affective level much more significantly than they function at the level of what we generally call military technique. Uh, in fact, you know, as it's been made clear by many journalistic editorials, which have had no effect, Boko Haram has had many, many more casualties uh, often during the events that when ISIS, you attach ISIS to it, suddenly it's, it's an international event. Why is that? Well, I think it's an affective difference, and it's the way that affect habituates racial geographies in ways that are non-spatial but still differentiated meaning we have a connection and a relation to ISIS that we don't have to Africa. It changes the way that we understand violence. 
The first, I'm going to argue, uh, it's a critical component of affect, which are what are called haptic techniques of ISIS. The way that they make images touch us, right? They're synesthetic. They mix our sense of touch and sight. The second is that ISIS as an event is atmospheric, right? This weaponization of things. And also, I think, a kind of re-characterization or affective charging of items, clothing, forms of life, habits, which ought not be seen as terrorist, but become terrorist imagery. Uh, I'm thinking particularly beards, veils, right? Particular kinds of dress, uh, which I think quite consciously uh, they connect to forms of violence and produce the worst in Western responses. See Trump. I don't know if people saw this, but in the exit polls in New Hampshire, two out of three Republicans said that there should be a temporary ban on all Muslims entering the United States. Two out of three Americans. Now, those are Republicans, but that is astronomically higher than anyone has ever been willing to say that out loud. Uh, so affect is having an effect. The next, and this is actually quite important for me, people who do affect and, uh, and critical terrorism studies, I think even Brian Massumi to some extent, have a tendency to reduce groups like ISIS uh, to the level of fiction, right? They say things like, oh, you're more likely to slip and fall in your bathtub than you are to be killed by terrorism. As if the quantitative difference in the death tolls of ISIS and the death tolls of hamburgers or bee stings or any number of examples that are often used in critical terrorism studies make people feel less afraid. This is one of those examples where data doesn't cross the affect threshold in a way that's useful. ISIS is real at the scale of affect. It's global at the scale of affect. And so actually, the comments by the Director of Homeland Security, uh, which said that ISIS will attack the United States for the first time within a year, are inaccurate. From an affective perspective, ISIS has already substantially attacked the United States. Uh, and whether or not they think this through as a strategy, gotten exactly what they need and want, which is the other half of the resonance machine. Right? Trump, Cruz, even people like Obama having to apologize for going to a mosque. Four, ISIS is affectively terraforming a world forming. And I mean this in the way uh, that Heidegger does. It creates a mood by which other events unfold. Uh, and that that actually changes the ball game for terrorism. It's not about measuring the particular effect of a particular attack, the strategic significance of a particular kind of weapon. It means that we are, in some ways, under the thrall of terror such that we make really stupid decisions on a very regular basis. And any kind of rational political response, anything we would call public policy, is often lost. The haptic. Uh, I think maybe one of the best examples of the haptic is a movie called Che en Balloon. There's an eye, you close in on the eye, and a razor blade cuts it. it ends up with a sheep's eye, it's a person's eye is getting cut. But you, you jerk when you see it. You can't help but jerk when you see it. It's an image that reaches out and touches you it's not simply an image that communicates. It's not a semiotic image. It's what Laura Marx calls a haptic image. The public executions of ISIS are maybe one of the best examples. Uh, the mixture of the gurgling sounds, not to be too disgusting, of people as they're having their throats cut. Actually, the throat itself is a particular zone of proprioceptivity, right? Where when something gets too close to your face or neck, you feel a sense of claustrophobia. Seeing it produces not just a kind of mimetic relationship where you see yourself as the person right, having your head cut off. You feel at some first cut that there's something in your throat. That haptic technique becomes particularly powerful when it's distributed. The collectivization of haptic feelings, that the character of the affect created by ISIS is one in which it has you by the throat, by one of the most nerve sensitive areas of the body. And that images at that point function very differently than the medium of something like spectacle or the way that we've done content analysis of image. Right? The image actually does something and that affect is, is a thing that's like a wave back at kind of, but you can't distinguish right, the cuts. Uh, but it moves through the image rather than being reducible to the image. It's semi-autonomous. This is supposedly the device that brought down the Russian plane. They bragged about it. They tweeted it. Uh, it was everywhere. And I don't think they chose such a common object simply because of the tactical significance that a common object would get through. 
even if they didn't mean to, it had that effect, right? Even a pineapple soda can represents the entire world coming apart, right? That the very things that we rest on at any moment can explode. That the objects themselves have us by the throat. This, I think we should call terraforming. It alters the conditions of possibility for future affect in the world. It's the terraforming of things such that affect now clings to them. It's adhesive, it sticks to them. You look a second time at a laptop when somebody pulls it out at security. You wonder, does that laptop turn on or does it explode? And this, I think, gets added to a number of semiotically overdetermined and overcharged ways of marking difference as forms of life. Very well-meaning people, who I think, quite honestly, are the kinds of people who make critiques of racial profiling. You see them tighten up on the plane. And we don't know what comes after that reactive force. right? We don't know if the conscious then intervenes and says, I shouldn't have tightened up. What we do know is that there is a kinesiology. right? There is a bodily habit to the way that racism is being charged. And we can see it in the responses to migrancy all over Europe and the United States. Uh, it's not the kind of common racism where it's merely ideology. It's a number of people that you thought might speak out, even prominent intellectuals. Slavoj Žižek, Jürgen Habermas, who are stuttering a bit in their defense of universal ideals or rights. And of course, the media and mediation helps it, right? They are Michael Bay too. It's not simply a search for the people in Paris, it's a manhunt. And actually, I, I couldn't quite get it to work, uh, but on CNN, when this was the headline, if you move the cursor, it flashed red. And flashing red is not semiotically significant. It's affectively significant. It's directly wired into your nervous system. It produces a sense of panic, the same way that sirens do, or the same way that flashing lights do. It's stroboscopic emotionally. Uh, and I think that alters the intensity which with these bodily habits become habits in the first place. And this leads to what Masumi calls the surplus value of affect meaning affect regenerating itself, meaning the fear can actually cause fear. Right? You can like work yourself up even more. And that, that actually becomes adhesive to non-events. So the FBI has listed in numerous American newspapers and websites uh, that it was wrong about having this screenshot of various people uh, claiming that they were you know, in service of ISIS or that they were somehow, you know, a, cert, you know a, a particular agent of ISIS. We have no evidence uh, that connects these events. Uh, Saeed Farouk and Tashfeen Malik could as easily have just been displeased with their job. They may have their own interpretation uh, of why they were in these events. Uh, despite that, you know, 14 people were killed, 22 injured, most of them county employees. And this is an ISIS event for the United States. I'm not kidding. Look at Trump's polling the day before this took place down 10 for the first time. It's the first time he'd had a negative dip, up 13 the next day. It isn't that creative or politically insightful to say, exclude Muslims from the United States after a terror attack. What's interesting is how well it worked. Right? It actually altered the way that he connected with other people. And this means that from a kind of force perspective, we're thinking about the impact of ISIS we don't need an intelligence trail from San Bernardino to ISIS anymore. Right? In fact, any event that takes place, the facts will not ultimately matter that much. Right? The way in which ISIS has created a mood and the way that that mood resonates with media and resonates with bodily fear will determine the impact or effect of those events independent of the truth. Heidegger famously said at the end that only a god can save us now. Uh, I think that quantum computing confronts us with a question, only a machine can save us now. And I'm going to say a couple things about why I think it can't. In fact, I think it magnifies these effects, particularly if we imagine two quantum computers going at it in mimetic violence and war. But in general, what I want to say is that these affective problems are not things that scale in space-time. Nothing that a quantum computer could do to amplify the speed 
or even seemingly the intelligence of machine intelligence, would give the capacity to understand the affective fallout of our actions and their reactions, and vice versa. The affect would be surplus value. There would be almost no way to constrain it. This, however, is Northrop Grumman's response, leveraging full spectrum cyber to neutralize enemy threats. Again, this presumes that the majority sort of projection of power from ISIS is an issue of credibility, right, or capability. You could shut down the network, and that would affect how much affect could be generated. Uh, and I don't think there's any reason to think that Northrop Grumman has figured out how to modulate affect. But quite the opposite. I want to argue uh, that affect is something that can only be displaced by other affect. Just before the second division of being in time, Heidegger says that mood changes how we care for being in the world. Right? And I would argue that, like Heidegger, we currently live, currently live under the tyranny of what he called a dark mood, a schwer mood, right? that disposed us to forgetting our relationship with the world, right? which sort of put the reptilian part of our brain, the reactive part of our brain, out front and center, and the reflective, sort of retrospective part of the brain uh, in the passenger seat. I think the same section provides some guidance about what to do with this predicament. Heider goes on to say that a mood can only be dispelled by another mood. And the person who takes this up, although before Heidegger, most interestingly is William James. Uh, he comes to the same conclusion in an essay he calls The Moral Equivalent of War. He says we can't banish affect from politics, nor can we outlaw insecurity or war. These are feelings and intensities. They're not things that we can get rid of with law. Instead, we have to dis displace it. What he means by a moral equivalent of war is something that is as seductive as war, as intensifying, right? That we actually have to generate counter affect machines, right? Things that will displace the tendency to be primed to always react to every violent event as if every violent event were connected, right? Today, we'll call it ISIS. A year ago, no, four years ago, we called it Al Qaeda. Uh, during the Reagan administration, we call it Islamic fundamentalism. Claire, Claire Sterling thought it was one big communist conspiracy. You can call it whatever you want. And even when it's fictional, as in the case of Claire Sterling and Al Haig, it was real. Right? It had affect, and that affect had effects. I don't have an answer for the easiest way to produce that effect. I have some ideas and some suspicions. I think, for instance, Climate adaptation comes to mind, that we have an intensive adventure for potentially species-wide survival. Rewilding comes to mind, right? That we might find other places to be and other ways to be in the world that could displace a constant readiness to feel the effects of the next threat as if it had already taken place. Insurgent forms of jo joyful life rather than the anxious monotony of routine life. At the very least, I think we can start from unplugging from the very circuits of affect that we accept are making our lives better. I don't mean to sound like a technophobe, but there is a characteristic for which we are under constant updates. Ian Bogos, in this essay he wrote on hyperemployment, makes the point that in an age of smartphones, we're never off duty. Right? It doesn't matter what our job is. Right? We could be heart surgeons who are on call or academics. Our phones are constantly dinging. For those of us who follow international politics, right, and we subscribe to particular Reddit accounts or particular streams, there's an event taking place all the time, punctuating with a ding or whatever tone we pick. Our phones vibrate. In fact, the DSM-5 is considering adding as an OCD the feeling that your phone is vibrating, even when it's not. And you're laughing because you've all experienced it. And that's actually the argument for not including it in the DSM-5, that it's so common we can't call it a pathology. So we are linked in. Our nervous systems are wired for affect. But we have overwired them for a kind of awareness which has no relationship to a reality principle or truth. Its index is measured in the intensity of the events that we focus on. Which doesn't mean that ISIS isn't real. But it does mean that a certain form of life has magnified the effect 
that ISIS can have. And until we take affect seriously as a way of investigating this non-spatiotemporality of, of relations, and we're going to look for the breadcrumbs of what connects ISIS to a sleeper cell in Paris, rather than figuring out what makes ISIS possible as a condition of possibility. Right. Thank you so much.